Hebrews chapter 4 tells us the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm Pastor Bob Gray. I pastor the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Thank you for taking the time to come visit our YouTube channel. The Word of God is preeminent here at church, and we pray that every time the Bible's opened, every time the Word of God is spoken, that lives are changed. Thank you again for being here. Enjoy the services, and if I can do anything for you, my number's at the bottom of the screen. I would love to to hear from you. Now, let's get right to the preaching of God's Word. Would you make your way to Luke, if you will, Luke chapter 17, and uh, let me kind of race there ahead of you, Luke chapter 17, and uh, just two things before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping uh, that I need to be make you all aware of, and that is if you're going to camp tonight, there is a, um, a uh, meeting tonight in the fellowship hall, and so I failed to, to say that, so right after the service, and I know that campers never pack until the night of, right? How many of you campers are packed for camp? Raise your hand. Are you serious? How many are not packed? How many are not packed? You're just going to throw it in there. There you go. Uh, so don't go to Walmart tonight. Walmart tonight with all Emmanuel Baptist people are going to be insane. Uh, so stay away from Walmart tonight. Um, but uh, and then the second thing is, uh, tonight may be the last night that you can buy a derby race car. Uh, come out to the lobby after church to buy a derby race car. They are $5. And uh, I am, I, I've never been involved in one of these things, but I am excited about seeing it. I am excited about the number of people that have signed up. And uh, I'm excited about racing one. So I'm going to have to come by and buy one and get into this race. Uh, but anyways, if you'll look there in Luke chapter 17, and that's where we ended last Sunday night, we talked about maturing your morals. Uh, we've gone through, I think, 14, 15 verses, wherever Joe's at. How many verses did we end up on, Joe? 15. And so Joe's keeping me right on track. And there's about 40 verses in total. Uh, and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to finish this tonight, but I do believe that the morals of our society, and I do believe that we do not realize how impactful morals can be. And, and last week we started down the path of maturing your morals. Moral, the word morals, uh, moral morals is not found in the Bible. Uh, conduct, the word moral means conduct, behavior, course of life in regards to good and evil. We reference Romans chapter 7 to where the apostle Paul, that which God decided to focus on, that man that God decided to focus on, he started saying, that which I should do, I don't even do, and that which I shouldn't do, that's what I do. In the very end of the chapter, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So please don't think that if you're struggling in that fork in the road between what is the, the, the right path and the wrong path, which one? Uh, and, and, and this is a, but we have to have a guide on the inside. And this guide on the inside cannot come, and I'm going to review for just a little bit here. It cannot come from where we were born. All of us were born in a different place under a different set of circumstances. And how, where we were born, just the mere culture of the county that you were born in, the place you were born, it, it, it cannot be the determining factor for your morals. Uh, your family traditions, your family traditions, no doubt, gave you a set of morals. I'm sure that there's a matriarch and a patriarch in your family that you look back at and you say, well, my daddy never did this or my mama never did this and my daddy used to say this and my mama used to say this. So understand that you and I can get caught up in the fact that we're basing our morals and then we're trying to better morals from family traditions. Y'all look right up this way, and uh, I just need to pause and say this. Anytime you see the security and the safety team move, um, we, there's a signal that I will receive if something's going on, and then I, you'll be the first to know, and then I'll give clear, clear instructions. Uh, there have been a couple of families that have texted me and even said something to me that, Pastor, every time somebody from the safety team moves my heart just kind of goes panicky. Uh, so please know uh, that we are on top of whatever's going on and you think you're panicked. I see them move long before you ever do. Uh, so if something happens, 
I will step up to this pulpit right here and I will direct traffic. And uh, so whatever's going on right now, let's stop and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are in complete control of everything that we do. We're not. And Lord, I praise God for the safety team and the safety team members. And, and Lord, I believe right now it's probably a medical emergency that uh, we're dealing with. And so I pray that uh, you would just uh, give those uh, the, the wisdom that they need and give the medical team wisdom as they deal with whatever situation it is. And uh, Lord, in light of possible situations, I just want to praise you that right now we're only dealing with medical, and we're not dealing with something um, that, that we probably uh, would be in a spot. Thank you for always protecting us here at the church. Um, I am amazed. I just truly am amazed. I do not look at us um, as Mecca. I do not look at us as anything other than we're just your children, trying to learn your word, trying to do the best we can. And I do thank you for the men uh, that are willing to uh, kind of play eyes and ears for the rest of us so that we can enjoy the service. God, please watch over and bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And uh, uh, so, so when we have our morals and when we go to make a decision between right and wrong, sometimes this decision is made on geography. Sometimes this decision is made on family traditions. Sometimes this is decision is made on the age of when you were introduced to Christianity. There are some things that second generation Christians do not see anything wrong with that those who have a BC, a before Christ, that they look at and they go, oh no, you don't understand where that's going to lead you. Well, for a second generation Christian, I have no reference point. I'm not better than anybody else in this auditorium, but I've never smoked. I have never drank. Uh, I have never been places that other people that, that they know. I am told stories, and I have no, we're okay, y'all. Um, I have no footprint for any of that. But I can't base my morals on that which I think will never happen to me. Nor can I base my morals on the fact that, well, you know, that's not, that's not really a big deal. So the age of when you're introduced to Christianity, situation ethics, um, you know, some things that, you know, are applicable in this situation are not applicable in this situation. And because of fear, we play this situational ethic game to where, you know, please listen, that, that would be fine if, if we weren't saved, but we're saved. And so the morals that we have must be filtered through the Bible. They have to be filtered through here. And if the word condemns it, then we need to condemn it. If the word approves it, then we need to approve it. If the word points toward something, and we're going to talk about a lot of this tonight, so, so understand that we, we started out by talking about the influences upon morals. You know, this, this, this clean sheet of paper to where parents are trying to raise their children and then... Um, what are these influences? Well, the Bible tells us that personalities can be an influence. And we talked about Galatians chapter 3, and we talked about Galatians chapter 5, to where you can be bewitched and ye can be hindered. These two words can cause you to not obey or to slow down in obedience. So these are the two things. So ladies and gentlemen, believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you're looking at is this the right way or is this the wrong way, understand that personalities can be overwhelming. But we cannot base our morals on the who. We must base the morals on the Bible. Now, now if the who wants to give you the Bible, then don't, 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 don't accept a moral unless somebody can go, what, what is the principle for this moral in my, bio, in, in my life? So personalities can do that. Places can influence your morals. And we talked about Genesis chapter 13 and verse number 10. We talked about the fact that Lot lifted up his eyes to a place called Sodom 
and Gomorrah. And so he was in a place that all of a sudden impacted the morals. I use this by permission. A family, and I forgot to talk about it last week, but a family called me and said, Pastor, can you drive to our house? So I went to their house, and they said, would you please come inside, and then would you walk with me? And we went to their back porch, and we looked out their back window, and the morals of the neighbors behind them were horrible. Then they came back in, and they said, now, with my children in this place, do you think we should sell? And I said, yes. Get your children out of this place because that immorality is going to be seen by your children and it is going to trouble them. Listen to your pastor, please. Just don't buy a house for the sake of buying a house. Drive around and check out the morals of that society. They do comps to figure out the value of the home. Why not do a moral comp to figure out the value your children are going to receive. When we moved into our house on Tulane, we were very blessed. We had, old, we had a retired preacher's wife to our right. We had godly people over here. We were surrounded by people, this is hard to believe, people that were my age, our age right now, and we thought they were old. Man, we thought they were old. So anyway, so I'm going to move on. Uh, so uh, you're... Never mind. Uh, so, so the places can influence it. And then we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I am coming back next Sunday night, and I'm going to walk through 1 Corinthians chapter 8 in its totality, but practices can influence others' morals. We, we, really, we really do not understand that when we become desensitized to the paganism that exists in this world, that we just may embolden somebody who has not to, to do things that they shouldn't do. And then, of course, our own passions can influence our morals. And uh, then I went to Luke chapter 17 and verse number 1, and, and I ended in Luke chapter 17 and verse number 1 last week. And I want to pick up right there tonight. And I know we have camp and everything, and this will not be a, a, teach, a, a preachy preachy, but more like a Bible study. But let's walk through it. Can we do that? We talked about in Luke chapter 17 verse 1, Then said, said he unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that the offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he is cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these what? Little ones. So now the context of the stumbling block and the offense is totally wrapped around those young ones. Adults, please do not give and educate these children to a world that you came out of. It is not fair. It is not fair to open up the cesspool and to pour in to minds who are still developing their discernment and give them mixed signals about morals because it, they're going to stumble. They're going to learn things they shouldn't learn. They're going to see things they shouldn't see. They're going to be acquainted with things they should not be acquainted with. But when we give it to them, when we put it in front of them, and then they start asking questions, we got issues. And morals are, 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 are worse. How many would agree that the morals today are worse than the morals when you were young? Okay, same cesspool, morals are getting worse, rampantly getting worse. You want to know why? Because adults truly think, well, I made it this far, and look, just because you and I made it this far, for every one of us that made it this far, there, there are hundreds who never made it out. Never made it out. Bury the dead. Let it die. And so, please, um, just, just know this. So now, the power of good morals. So, so let's talk about this, how powerful are good morals. We know how powerful morals are that influence for bad. You can be bewitched. You can be hindered. You can be put in a place of Sodom and Gomorrah. It can ignite your passion. It can put you on a path to lust and being drawn away, enticed, and then sin when it is finished bringeth forth what? Death. You know that people are being exposed to bad morals when spiritually they're not alive. 
Now, that was a bold statement right there, but I think we're okay. Because sin, when it is finished, James, bringeth forth what? Death. So when sin, that is, happens because of the lust that's on the inside of us, because we're drawn away. Please, no. Your children were born in iniquity. Sin did their mother conceive them. And so the Bible is very clear, for by one man sin entered into the world, so that sin, death passed upon all men, for all that all have sinned. Everybody starts out with the hampering of this flesh. Please don't throw gasoline on something that's already on fire, or may I say, be very careful that you don't take this world that you have become numb to, or you think you're okay, because look how much God's done in our life. And the closer you get it to that match, the more she's going to ignite. It doesn't even have to touch. So now we look at 1 Peter, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 3. How powerful are the right kind of morals? And then where do we establish these morals at? Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse number 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. This is a principle for wives, but the application is amazing. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may be may without the word be won by the what? Conversation of the wives. Conversation, conduct. The Bible's very clear that if a wife has a husband that does not obey the word, that she can set the word aside when it comes to this relationship, but she can use the conversation or the conduct of how she lives to win her husband. Well, if this husband's not obeying the word, then her conversation and morals cannot be outside the word and expect to win the husband. You see, sometimes we think, I'll just be a good person and, and that'll be enough. It won't be enough. Your morals can't be filtered through what you think. The morals have to be filtered and the conduct must be filtered through what God's word says. Because look at verse number two. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with what? Fear. This is a conduct that is chaste. This is a conduct that is above the fray. Chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, adorning of the plating, the hair, and of the wearing of gold, and the putting on of apparel, but let it be, what please, the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the women. Is that what your Bible says? Holy. Holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. Adorned themselves how? Go back to verse 3. With the outward plating of the hair or the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel. That's not how they adorn themselves. They adorn themselves with the what, please? Hidden man of the heart. So now, with this in mind, and the word conversation is the word conduct, morals is the word conduct, a moral life is a life that is very powerful. And a moral life is something that you don't even have to use the word, but there is something amazing how that chase conversation. It's just not conversation. The Bible says it is chase conversation. And according to 1 Peter chapter 3, where does this chase conversation start? On the outside? No. This chase conversation starts where? Right there. That hidden man of the heart. And I've already turned from there, but I think there about verse number three, it talks about the hidden man in the heart, and then it used something about the word corruption. Is that what it says there? Somebody help me out. I, Brother Glosser, what's it say right there? So that part of you that is not corruptible, that is where the holy 
Spirit of God. Did y'all hear that? So where do you start building your morals? You don't start with family traditions. You don't start with geography. You don't start with personalities. You don't start anywhere but at the seat of that which is not corruptible. What? Know ye not that your body, you've been bought with a price, your body is the temple of the, what? Holy Ghost. There are times that we drive through East Texas. As Kelly and I took a drive last night, late last night, about, it was getting about dusk, and we were just driving the back roads from us, and we came, we came up, and, uh, and we were looking at a house, and we kind of pulled up, and we were looking at it, and just kind of admiring it. And on the way out from this house, we noticed that to the right was, was a place that somebody lived, and, and our first response was not favorable. Don't look at me like that. It, it, it was like not favorable. Nice house, not favorable house. Whether you like it or not, how a house looks on the outside creates the opinion of the people on the inside. And this is why God said, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And this is why our morals cannot be about what pleases this body and how close can we get to the shadows. Brother Charles, I'm going to have you play light man back there, and there's a dimmer switch on the lights right here. Could you all just kind of dim those lights, if you would? Here's how most people live in their life. Most people live, just keep dimming, most people live in as much light as they can. Stop. But they still can kind of... God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And the reason that we must battle the flesh according to the Bible, not according to traditions, not according to geography, not according, no, 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 no. Because you know what we want? We want, go ahead, total light. We want total light, and then somebody has got to be battling with the inner man, this inward man that's renewed every day. And that's why every day you bring your temple to the Holy Ghost of God. You walk around that temple and you constantly asking yourself, Holy Spirit of God, this body is your temple. This is where you reside. Is this decoration, is this landscaping in keeping with your holiness? And ladies and gentlemen, the biggest battle you have is start dimming it, if you don't mind, is when it starts to become dim and you know and you sense that it's starting, it's not, it's not as bright, hold it, time out, there's a shadow, that's when you're like, God, I am so sorry, I want total light again in my life, kick it back up, and then all of a sudden it's total, this is the battle. So where do you start, ladies and gentlemen, you start with the heart. So then we must go back to the word of God. So how do you establish the morals? And let me begin. First of all, you establish them through the word of God. Through the word of God. Let's go. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Would you look at it, please? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. We must have something that gets down into the thoughts and intents of the heart. We must realize that everybody we're responsible for, that we don't want them to battle their morals at the action. We want to be so pro-God and so pro-Word of God. Look at it. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Look at this. And is a what? Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the... When we operate and we start establishing our morals through the Word of God, then we let the Word of God get down into our thoughts and intents of the heart. The thoughts, the intention. The intention, this is what I want to do. The thoughts, this is how I'm going to get it done. 
God, what do you think? And then all of a sudden, you're going to find out that the Word of God will start discerning. Most people that are trying to establish their morals according to their history, their past, their family, their geography, the personalities around them, the current day culture around them, and they are not establishing it according to the Word of God, don't like what I'm about to show you. Because morals are very powerful, and godly morals are are amazing you fight this good fight of morals with the word of god and you need the word of god to get down into the thoughts and intents you know i talked about meditation this morning and in talking about meditation this morning i truly believe that we don't put enough word of god in us so that the word of god can discern us something should be pinging on the inside. Verses should be ringing all over the place. When you have a moral decision to make, the Bible should be that Rolodex that just keeps going. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15, and I'm just going to give verses because we're running out of time. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse number 15. 10. Let's go back to verse number 10, if you would. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, being, being, being out of them, all, all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So you have two people with two sets of morals. You have those who live godly, those who live evil. But then look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of what whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child... Thou hast known, Paul talking to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the what, please? Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee what? Wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, that's Old Testament, New Testament, all Scripture, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what, please? Perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just seen the maturation process that takes place to take a child from a child to a man that's furnished, ready for good works, ready to go. He's complete. How did it happen? The scriptures. And the scriptures must dictate our doctrine. And the scriptures must t- dictate our no's. And the scriptures must dictate our yes. Because the same scripture that is able to make us wise is able to equip us and it's able to make us perfect. So the scriptures through the word of God. So now we know the power of the word of God. Now can I give you a sampling of the word of God that starts setting morals? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. So when you start looking at the scriptures as this, God, give me your mind. God, give me your heart. God, give me your opinion. Then we start knowing, and let me give you a sampling of a a set of verses that, and and by the way, um, I feel like I need to take a Sunday night in two weeks and start just giving you sampling verses that start guiding morals. Um, I I assume, and and I should never assume, assume, but you would assume that passages are clear in light of decisions of right and wrong. And so let's look at a sampling of something that should guide your morals. So if the Word of God should be discerning our thoughts and intents, and if the Scriptures are powerful enough to make us wise and to make a full-grown, mature Christian out of us, then let's look at a sampling. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 5. For this ye know that nor whore, no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. 
Be not ye therefore, what please? Partakers with them. With who? Somebody just hollered at me, with who? When we start living our morals and we partake with any society that is a whoremonger or an unclean person or a covetous man, an idolater, these are not part of God's world. And then look at verse number six. Let no man deceive you with vain words. God still has a wrath yet to be poured out upon the children of disobedience. Y'all, God still has a wrath that is being stored up against his day. And right now he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. I think all of us at times violate Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 7. And if right now, dear believer, you're thinking about somebody else rather than yourself, then I would ask you to turn that window into a mirror and that you look into the word of God and ask yourself, are you partaking with the children of disobedience? Or if you re- reverse that, are you taking part? Well, I'm not, I'm not a whoremonger, but are you taking part? I'm not an adulterer, but are you taking part? I, I'm not a God denier. I'm not a child of disobedience. I'm saved, but are you a partaker? And it is very easy in this day and time to do things entertainment-wise and to do things association-wise and to do things that pleasure us and we don't even realize that our morals are partaking of people who are disobedient. This should guide our morals. Look at verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. Not all the time. Well, pastor, the, 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 this world has some good in it, doesn't it? Yeah, the Bible says, and we'll get to it in, in, when we talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and, that, and, and the neighbors right there along that corridor of chapters. Yes, we can use this world as not abusing this world, but we are not to use the darkness of this world in any of us because we're light. And that's why the Bible says that, that we... we be ye not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all godliness and righteousness truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. I want you to notice verse 11. And have no fellowship with the, look at that next word. It's biblical, it's right there in the King James. Unfruitful. Unfruitful. Can, can I ask all of us a question? What godly fruit is coming out of a work of darkness? What prophet for God came out? I, like you, am human. I, like you, my flesh craves certain things. There are certain things my mom and dad said were not wrong. But I found out in the Bible they were wrong. There are certain things my mom and dad said were right. And I found out in the Bible they were right. And all of a sudden I'm sitting here going, so who do I adjust to? Do I adjust to what my parents allowed? No. I adjust to what the word says. Because I'm a child of God. You see, on March 27, 1979, I switched parents. I, I, I went to a father, an older brother. I went to being a child of God, part of the royal priesthood. I now, residing in me since I've been 12 years of age, is the Holy Spirit of God. Has this temple always act holy? No. No, not at all. But the times it didn't act holy was the most times I was miserable. 
Because in God there's light. And I'm just asking you, would you consider these verses right here? So if the Word of God is this kind of force, then this is a sampling of how the Word of God should dictate. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of righteousness, but rather reprove them. It goes deeper. Look at verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Them is referring to who? The children of disobedience, the whoremongers, the idolaters. Our society did something five, six, seven years ago. Our society convinced people to let them bring a camera crew and film reality TV. Reality TV went into homes and it literally showed the depravity of the home. It then put us in this moral dilemma as a nation. Well, that's just reality. So our whoremongers, idolaters, covetous, children of disobedience, but God gave us this, look at it, it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So this sampling, I've just given you a sampling of verses that should guide our morals from the word of God. And when these verses rest in the heart of the believer, then it's a no-brainer when something's put on the, in, in front of you that you go, oh, oh, no, 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 I can't do that because, because over here in Ephesians chapter 5, could, could, I, could, could I show you this, sir, over here in Ephesians chapter 5, but if we're all living to what grandpappy said, and if we're all living to what happened, then you know what we do? I, mean, I know that, but, but I got this one. None of us got this one. We don't even know what the world's getting ready to roll out. I was going to show a clip up here. I was going to show a clip. And when I started, I asked somebody about the clip. And they said to me, Pastor, basically I beg you, do not go look at that clip. But if I were to call the movie and I were to call the genre of that clip, it is promoting sodomy. And we're getting sucked in, ladies and gentlemen. I know I'm odd, but I'll be okay at being odd. Because I still believe there's 7,000 out there who are basing their morals on that book, and they don't mind adjusting their morals according to that book. This is a sampling of what the Word says. I love this verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So now we know that the Word of God is where we set our morals, and I'm not going to rush, and I think I'll pick it up next, next Sunday night. But now I want you to go, how do we establish our morals? And our morals are very, good morals are very powerful to change people who don't live according to the word. Do not think that your connect with influence has to be with something from the world. Your connect with influence should be something that that, that pings the heart where God lives in that believer. Your influence is important. If a wife can win a husband without the word by dealing with the hidden man of the heart, then you and I, my friend, can absolutely change somebody around with what, please? God. Light. And I think that we live in a battle in this day and time, and, and, and I really, I'm going to tell you a story and, and I think I'm going to end with this, musicians, if you'll come. And we'll pick up next. I have one, two, three, four, five, six more ways that we establish our morals. If we are trying to get a connect, I'm going to take the, just that 
verse there in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to give you a personal illustration that I will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on judgment day and I will give an account for this. One of our couples worked hard at winning this husband and this wife. Great couple. They got saved. I baptized them right up there. They were going through discipleship and um, he called me one day. He said, Pastor, can I can I talk with you? And I said, absolutely, man, absolutely. We went out and we sat down. And I'll never forget it. We were sitting and we were talking. And because I wanted to connect with him, I, I, I just wanted to connect with him, I reached into darkness and I pulled out darkness, and I violated Ephesians chapter 5. I spoke of something that the children of disobedience, only to try to get this bro, he was growing at such a high rate of speed. When I said that, he pushed back and he said, so let me get this straight. Like, you think that's acceptable? And I was like, well, you have to understand that. He said, no, pastor, I love you. I respect you deeply. But why am I fighting? You referenced. And he never came back to church. I pass him every, about once a month I pass him at his job, and he works a certain job here, and he's a professional. And him and his dear wife would sit in that balcony. They would grow in the word. But because I thought, that's no big deal. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. That has no bearing. And I forgot I was not trying to get him to become my kind of Christianity. I was trying to get him into the morals of that book. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But take heed, verse number 9. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are, what, weak. Those are people that have not been afforded the teaching, the exposure to Christ like you have. This was this dear brother. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple. Would you look at that? It wasn't what he was eating because 1 Corinthians 8, we're, we're told that meat means nothing. And there's other passages. But we're in this place feasting on this meat that we, we, we know this is not where we need to be. This is not what we need to be feeding our spirits. Look what it says. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak, be what please, emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, not go to hell, but go back to the temple for whom Christ died. Oh, would you look at the judgment against your pastor when I stand before the Lord among many, many things. But when ye sin so against the brethren, that's how we know the word perish doesn't mean hell because you can't lose your salvation. When you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. That day when we ended that conversation, I knew in my spirit I had crossed a line. Went to his house right away. They lived right over here. Went to his house. 
he wasn't home. I knocked on the door. His wife answered the door. And I said, look, your husband's not answering his phone. Would you tell him to call me when he gets, when he gets home? He didn't call. I went back the next Saturday. And I said, look, I missed y'all this past Wednesday night. They, they were coming Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But I just had to be smarter than the book. And I just had to play it close to the line. And I promise you that this man is going to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ because I sinned against Christ. Because I just had to reach back into a little bit of darkness. Then I asked myself, how did you even get in that position, Bob? Bob, you're smarter than this. You are elite pride. Here's how. Start dimming the lights. Because I allowed myself to start living based on my experience. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I can still see you. You can still see me. But there's something comfortable with me right now that I am in the shadow. And now you can't see me as closely as you could before. And that's why if I could take you back, and I won't do it this time, but if I could take you back to Ephesians chapter 5, I think we read in there that the light makes manifest and that the light always reproves. Go ahead and turn the light all the way up. So when the light's all the way on, it's reproving even me. Ladies and gentlemen, maturing your morals goes much deeper than your experience Maturing your morals must be based on this because you don't know the wickedness that is being rolled out of the world. Hollywood has yet to unleash on this world its latest movie and trends and junk. And do you know what the devil's hoping happens? Go ahead and dim the lights. Is that believers live such a shadow life that they accept it they swallow it. Let this not, let this not, Paul said, let this not be named once among us. You say, oh, pastor, pastor, are you serious? This is not about your pleasure. This is about that brother's eternity. It's about them being exposed to as much God as they can be exposed to. I'm pleading with you. We're in a fight. We're in a fight for the morals of this country. And the morals of this country, and if judgment's going to begin, let it begin at the house of God. Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, 1 Peter 3, I could give you chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter that gives us the guidelines for where our morals should be. But we live in a day and time where people don't want to hear it. And this is sad to me. Go ahead and turn the lights up. Emmanuel, let's let the Bible be our guide. And the first moral that I think you should establish is this. Help me to be humble enough to recognize I'm not smart enough. And God guide me. Thank you for spending your time with us. Whether you watch the entire sermon or you just scrubbed yourself through to different points, I do appreciate you taking the time. If I can do something for you, please let me know. And I would encourage you, keep living for the Lord Jesus Christ, keep putting him first and tell others about him and I promise you you'll find that fulfillment that you're looking for. God bless you. Thank you for watching us.